the first topic um, that we wanted to talk about is having to do with markets and prices. And I wanted to let um, Shannon go ahead um, first with this and talk about a, her um, fact sheet that um, she and some other folks um, recently put together or updated about organic budgets. And this is one of the attachments that um, you should have received in the email. So if you wanted to just introduce that document, Shannon. You're there we go. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to share my screen. Sure. Yeah, that would be great. If that works, um, if that works the best. Yep. Um, so are you able to share? And I'd like to give a shout out to Stephen for um, giving me a ring yesterday. Uh, his father-in-law has helped put these budgets together in the past. And um, we updated these for some new prices and our new custom rates. And so he kind of looked them over yesterday and, and shared some um, updates. So that's really helpful. Uh, whenever we create these budgets, we reach out to service providers, we reach out to farmers. Um, a disclaimer about the budgets is it's not everyone's cost, but it's an estimation of what you can potentially um, have as income and what your potential costs would be. So uh, enterprise budgets, a lot of them are floating around on the internet, um, mostly from uh, universities and extension services. And you can use those as really a, a good template um, as you get started. So I'm gonna share, let me make sure we're sharing the right screen and you're seeing, um, I'll pull up the Excel document because I'll make sure you get both of those. Are you seeing my Excel document there? Yep. We can see that. All right, it might be a little small. So the Excel document is, is one workbook, okay? And it's saved and then there's worksheets down below here, um, tabs that you can click on and move across. Uh, we did make some assumptions in this analysis. Um, we have a land charge. Um, we have some operating expenses that we borrow. Um, we have to make some assumptions on fertility rates, you know, so we can make some decisions based on how much um, manure may be needed for say the, the corn uh, budget. We did not include organic licensing, um, time or labor cleaning or record keeping in these budgets. I think this would be um, something that you may wanna account for when you create these on your own. Um, as you go across, so here's, I think maybe the chart would be the easiest to show, which is a summary. And um, this shows the income. We have three different types of cropping systems here. We have conventional corn uh, using poultry litter as the fertilizer, and then it would be the fall legume crop, so the previous legume crop. Uh, we have conventional soybeans, and then we have uh, the no-till soybeans. And you can see the estimated income. We have variable costs, and those are costs associated with each acre. So um, you add another acre, you're going to add additional seed, you're going to add additional inputs. And then the fixed costs we use when we create these budgets are something called custom rates. And that is a survey that we do every other year on production practices. So we send it out statewide to farmers, to ag service providers and say, how much do you charge to harvest? How much do you charge to spray? How much do you charge to disc? And they send us back with a um, per acre or per bushel charge, and we can use these on the budget. And um, those custom rates include the field practice, the machinery, fuel, and labor. So there's a, a rate that's included in there. And um, you'll see when we click on these budgets, the first part here will be the income. Uh, so we've got our estimated bushel per acre and what the estimated price would be. We also include the cover crop payment in there um, because we would be using the Maryland cover crop program. The next section that I'm highlighting here are the variable costs. Again, they're gonna change as you increase the acreage, right? So the more acres, the additional seed that you would need, additional poultry litter, additional lime, uh, crop insurance is rated on a per acre basis. So those would be the, um, the average variable costs that you would incur. 
As we move down to the next one, here's our fixed cost. So these are all the field practices that you would have um, as you're putting this fall cover crop in and the conventional corn in. So you have the um, aerial cover crop seeding, some plowing and field work. You've got the costs associated with poultry litter, which is the main um, fertilizer source for, for corn. Uh, you've also have the harvesting and the, the hauling expenses there. So those are the fixed costs. And then the bottom section is something that I like there in this yellow chart. Um, this, this bottom section is a sensitivity chart and it just kind of does this what if scenario. So what if your prices are 12% more or 12% less? What if your yield is 25% less or 25% more? And you can kind of look at what those scenarios might be on a per acre basis. Um, then you kind of can do some calculations, what's your break even, um, which is really helpful if you're doing any pricing or forward contracting with your grain, you can choose a break even price. Um, you've got your variable cost per unit. So for every extra acre, it's gonna cost you $2.42 to plant. Um, your total cost per unit and then your profit per unit. So um, once everything is done and you've hit your estimated yield and price, it would be $2.19 per acre. Um, so this sort of um, format is done for each of the crops that we've put together here. Um, conventional soybeans, again, make this a little bit larger. You can see, um, you know, we've sectioned it off gross income, variable costs, and then fixed cost. And then again, we have the sensitivity analysis here and what the break even is and also the profit per unit. And then we have, um, this is the organic no-till soybean budget. And so Shannon, if, if a farmer wanted to come to you to you know, work through some of these um, possibilities, is that, that something that would be easy enough to schedule um, an appointment to do something along those lines? Absolutely, absolutely. I'd be happy um, on our page and participants of this will receive both in the PDF and an Excel version of this. And you can easily insert columns, you can change prices as you need to. Um, but this is a really a helpful way to start making some decisions. And we encourage all of our green producers to go through these budgets on an annual basis, make some decisions. And you know, a budget may be different for, you know, your average yield is different maybe field to field, right? Or production practice to production practice. Um, but to know that break even cost, what is break even to you so you can start pricing um, is, is very, very helpful, um, especially in a, in a grain scenario. So we'd be happy to help go through these. Um, I'm gonna, I'll share these again with, with Aaron and Steven and see if they had any updates um, on this. I, again, the fixed costs I think are one of the hardest because different people have equipment. Um, so maybe I bought brand new, but Sarah has something used and Steven rents it. So, you know, there might be multiple ways that um, the field practices, but you definitely wanna include the machinery costs and labor. That's one of the things that we find people really um, maybe underestimate or, or don't put enough estimation in. Um, into these practices because there is time and equipment associated with, with these crops. Great, thank you, Shannon. Um, and then we had a couple other questions about marketing and prices and I'll just open it up to all three of you, um, just uh, chime in um, with any of these. I'll, I'll list off a few questions and you can address those that you would like. So some of the questions were, uh, what are the market outlets for organic grain and then also for transitional grain during that transition process? And what is the marketing process like for the farmers who are trying to find buyers for their organic or transitional grain? 
our contract stable, our prices stable, and what about crop insurance for transitional and organic grain versus conventional grain? Um, so I'll open it up to you all. Um, I guess I'll just uh, start off uh, with uh, this operation in 2006 is when uh, my father-in-law Bill uh, started the transition process. He was able to fortunately have a farm, a rented farm down the road that was ready to be certified, didn't have to go through a transition process. And he was able to immediately get the uh, organic income from that farm. Of course, this, this is just one scenario. Everybody is going to have a different experience, and especially with the transition process. But for, for this operation, it started like that in 2006, and it was a step-by-step -step process over the next uh, about seven or eight years to transition uh, this home farm, which is about 600 acres total. And I think I did forget to mention we're strictly a grain farm, corn and soybeans, have done small grain in the past. I'd like to get back into it hopefully in the future, but um, any transitional ground uh, to mention that, that we had on this farm, uh, they would always put into soybeans for two years right away. Uh, a little less um, risk involved with soybeans, fewer inputs, I don't have to worry about uh, uh, fertilizer a component of things uh, for soybeans. Um, corn always became the focus, whether it was the conventional corn where you, that hadn't been transitioned yet early on, or if he had some organic corn. Uh, but the soybeans seemed to be a list in his mind, and I tend to agree, a little more uh, forgiving, a little less management um, intensive uh, than the corn ground would be. So two years starting out uh, in the transitional process um, for uh, with, with soybeans, and then that third year coming in, in that fall, finally, when the corn harvest comes off, uh, you're transitioned. Uh, and uh, you have the income from the corn, kind of like you start with kind of a, a kind of a, a bang, I guess. <laughs> and another thing to mention about he was able to find some for the uh, at least his transitional soybeans, he, an operation up in Pennsylvania, um, a farmer up there who was grinding some grain, and he was able to establish uh, a relationship uh, up there with the farmer for his soybeans, uh, slowly but surely. And that did eventually uh, uh, peter off and tail off. Um, but at first, it was a nice option for that transitional product that, that soybeans that had the price just about right between the organic price and the, the conventional price for beans that helped just buttress and help just um, support them um, that way, uh, support the, you know, the, just hedge the risk some. Um, also, I think there was even one point where it had about 40, 45 acres in uh, an older, um, equip program organic transition program where you could put it in a cool season and legume mix and let it sit for three years and then come the, the third year uh put your you know probably start with corn take advantage of some of the legume there that was um that was growing for a little bit of the nitrogen and you'd have some uh, initial heat control having maintained and mowed that mix on that on that acreage and, and i believe that the rates back then you know almost well, about 10 years ago were i think uh, Quite a bit higher than they are right now. Um, yeah, they were I'm like sure, hundred and sure. eighty dollars an acre. It was, it was pretty good. Yeah, it's nothing yes, like it was. that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> and uh, so took advantage of that in, uh, in one or two instances. Um, so you know, in a combination with with um, uh, having a farm ready to go and for this operation and uh, starting with soybeans, a little less risky, not doing any small grains, transitional. Um, since it didn't seem that, at least at that point, didn't seem to be much of a market uh, for them. Um, and then jumping in with corn on that third year and moving forward with that uh, seemed to be the best, the best way to go about it. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to the transitional because I, I, I make feed locally, um, I don't know, maybe about 150 tons a year. Um, and I use transitional grain and most of it's my own transitional grain. And that's kind of been my model to to transition, you know, kind of baby steps, like 60 or 70 acres of my, my dad's land every two or three years, uh, you know, in that transition cycle and use the, the grain in the feed and then kind of, um, you know, I'm, I'm making extra money on that grain, you know, through the feed, uh, you know, the, the up calls, up charge on, on the grain on the feed versus, you know, taking it to like Purdue locally and getting very low price for it. Um, and I, I try to model, um, Steve was talking about the guy in Pennsylvania, my I try to follow his prices on, you know, what I'm valuing my transitional grain at. Um, and I've bought transitional grain from uh, Bill and Steve years ago when they had a farm, you know, maybe an hour away where I was able to go right to the field and 
pick a trailer load up. I, I usually, I don't grow enough on my own as my demand increases. So I've, I'll buy like a couple trail loads locally from various farmers. Um, so, I mean, as far as the people that, that question about markets, I would say I'm not a, I'm not a market really. It's just kind of a very small, but it's probably going to go to Pennsylvania if there's a market for it. But then you're, you're looking at what 50 cents to a dollar a bushel to get it there. So you have to look at that cost. Um, you know, it, it, it has to be worth storing it or hauling it out of the field to, to the guy way up in Pennsylvania. Um, so, and then uh, as far as organic grain, I think Steve touched on most of it, but um, I, mine's gone to all the soybeans pretty much go to crushing plants in Pennsylvania. Um, and with Herlock and Purdue and Herlock um, in the center of the Eastern shore um, takes corn and wheat there, feed grade wheat. Um, and some of my, I've had or, organic corn and barley go out to um, Shenandoah Valley, Virginia. That's probably the, maybe even, um, you know, somewhere out in North Carolina too. I've had, you know, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, Eastern shore, Maryland. That's kind of, it usually has to go pretty far. Herlock's nice and close, but um, otherwise it's, um, and, you know, a lot of times, sometimes the buyer will pay the freight. Sometimes they won't. Um, you have to negotiate that in the contract. What else did we not touch on yet? <laughs> There's a lot of questions in there in that first segment. Um, contracts, uh, I, th I think they're stable. Um, if you sign a contract, you know, it's, um, yeah. It, and then price prices, you know, they vary. It's the market factors are different on organic grain than conventional grain. It's, I guess, more, um, local factors come into play. Like everybody says when a ship of corn comes in from, I don't know, Argentina to the port of Baltimore, the price of organic corn drops. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> so that's, that's why it's good to contract ahead, you know, part, part of your crop to make sure you're going to have a stable price that season. Um, how, and, how much do you guys usually forward contract? I mean, do you do, you do about half of your crop? A third? That, that's what I, I normally do half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if I do it. Um, for us around here, actually, there, um, I'm not sure Bill's ever entered a, um, a contract before. It might have been one year, and I think it might have been with Purdue. We were forecasting some a um, little more uh, corn um, than we had storage for. We have grain storage. That's a big factor in the reason why we really don't get into contracts. We do have a way to uh, manage our price a little bit, especially if we want to hold some after the first of the year, after the glut of you know crop season harvest comes in, price is always lower um, you know in the throughout the fall. And having storage, having having rain tanks would uh, able to dry them too, um, has I think just allowed us that a little bit of flexibility. Uh, we have four currently four grain tanks, eighteen thousand bushels uh, a piece, and they hold um, about ninety percent of our crops. We typically will have a little more, like I said, corn, and this year was the same than we have storage for. Uh, we will get it harvested for first corn harvested, get it dried down. And then we'll send it out right away. Plus, that just helps a little bit with the cash flow, pay some bills, uh, things, get at least the most important ones uh, right away. And uh, then we uh, we'll typically, uh, for our soybeans, we're, we're dealing with all of our crops up in PA at Glen uh, area, up above Lancaster in the Lancaster area, and shipping them up there. Um, had to have a little change this year for soybeans, though I like to mention, is um, the uh, typically, we're just sending our, our, our beans right out of the tank, as long as they're dry, uh, straight up. The, um, the company would take care of the hauling for us. Uh, not, uh, uh, we'd still be paying, but they would line it up for us. It, was, it made it pretty easy, um, pretty easy going, uh, figuring that out. They'd just call when they're showing up, and we'd be at the tank and hit the button and run the auger. Uh, but now, uh, it seems like it's been bought out. I think Cargill bought out this company. And... They're still taking organic products, much lower price, unfortunately, but we've found a company that can, trans can, can travel and be um, uh, from farm to farm to roast beans. And we can get a little better price for these beans, albeit with the cost of the roasting and all. It still works out about the same per bushel uh, profit after it's all said and done with the hauling as, uh, as we had before in comparison. Uh, so, but that was a little change of uh, this company. Yeah, they have to come in, roast the beans right on site, I'll have to put them in another tank and then we'll have to uh, haul them out. So we'll be, we'll be starting that process probably in the next month or so, at least trying some, trying a few loads, see how it goes, work out the kinks 
and that's just that's just all part of uh, uh, the market and little subtle changes year to year. You know, thankfully we knew a fair amount ahead of time, had a good relationship with the, uh, the grain mill, and they they let us know, so we were able to get some ideas lined up and and find someone to, to do that roasting. So in terms of crop insurance for organic and transitional versus conventional, um, if there aren't any major reflections on that, we can move on to the next section. But if you have any thoughts, that would be interesting to hear. Yeah, I mean, there is, it's, it's regular crop, grain crop insurance, it's, but the prices reflect organic. Um, I wouldn't say they reflect East Coast organic necessarily on what, what they're offering, but um, in transitional, I don't think there's a special price for that. I, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, Aaron, you're, you're correct. Um, yeah, the crop insurance is roughly the same. The only thing we've changed, a bill had changed um, when having conventional and organic crops is maybe the, the coverage. Uh, a little bit, probably a little higher coverage, I think, with his organic corn. Mm -hmm. A little more risk. Um, you know, you just don't have those in-season uh, products, you know, if you needed them. Uh, rescue products in, in terms of, uh, you know, sprays and, and uh, pesticides, things like that. So uh, soybeans is usually about uh, rough, roughly the same uh, for soybeans, uh, conventional and as, as organic soybeans. Um, but uh, I'd say just the corn having a little more protection on that, um, help buffer, you know, you know, drought or too much rain or both, um, or 2020. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, that's really helpful. So this next question I think is probably more geared towards Aaron since you come from a background where you were shifting from conventional into organic. Uh, you know, people, farmers who are coming into this from strictly a conventional background and they have the equipment, you know, that's geared towards that system. Um, there's this question of um, the what equipment you need to purchase that's different for organic production and what is the are there pieces of equipment that you can use from conventional system and just either clean or you know make some small adjustments to um yeah i guess if you could talk a little bit about about what what equipment you can use in both systems and then what additional equipment you would need to have and kind of like a cost discussion of that as well mm -hmm. Well, the, so as far as the same equipment, I mean, um, a, a disc, um, that's, that's, you know, my main tillage. Um, and, you know, we actually ended up buying a disc, a good disc, because we didn't have a good one. Um, it's, you know, the farm was no-till before. Uh, so a decent disc, um, you know, I, I don't do any plowing. Sometimes I chisel plow. So we already had a chisel plow, um, you know, to break up compaction. Um, obviously, tractors sized to the equipment. Um, and, uh, you know, a regular corn or soy, you know, corn soybean planter, and then a, a grain drill, if you're going to do, um, plant cover crops with that or, um, plant wheat, you need a grain drill. Um, uh, so that, you know, a conventional farm would probably have all that equipment on hand. Um, uh, I guess if you're starting from scratch, that's different. Um, the different equipment you would, you would need to add would, um, I mean, if you're going to do conventional tillage and not even, you know, start with no-till, you could get by with a fairly inexpensive uh, row crop cultivator like an S-Tine, um, you know, whatever row has to match your planter row spacing um, and ro rows on your planter pretty much. Um, and I've never had much luck with a rotary hoe, <laughs> but some people use them. I know Steve and Bill use them and um, a tine weeder, I guess, is another um, I, I don't really have one that works very well. I tried to build my own and I kind of have it parked now. Um, I've had more luck with a flamer, a uh, row crop flamer, which is, um, you know, a fairly inexpensive piece of equipment, um, uh, compared to, I mean, I guess, I don't know, Steve, you probably know, cause you have, you have rotary hose and time meters too. And are they all similar price to the same width for, as a flamer? Um, our flamer is, um, matches our planter width, which is an eight row or 20 mm -hmm. foot, um, unit. And, um, so eight row units and, uh, our, our tine harrow and our rotary hose, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's light blind cultivation. We can go a little bit wider and get it done much more quickly, mm -hmm. which we do like uh, initially at, right after planting. 
if it's a conventionally tilled field, we'll use we'll rake the ground, create a, a dust mulch, try to disturb the first inch, inch and a quarter, sometimes inch and a half, depending how deep you planted it. Depends on, of course, that depends on other factors. You know, the time of year, how warm the soil is, your uh, maybe your weed history, your field. But um, uh, Aaron basically covered the the, the types of equipment, uh, uh, the different types of equipment that you need, you know, every, a lot of the other things that we do have a mold board plow. We do for our corn, we like to mold board plow. We, we, thought, we think we found a better result where we have a clean slate on top of the ground. Um, we seem to have problems of just trying to disc or chisel plow, uh, working that ground, that corn ground. It's a lot of biomass to deal with. We, since we're growing our legume, for example, you have uh, not including the small grain that's mixed in there because the cover crop program that probably 6,000 pounds of um, dry matter, dry matter biomass you have to do something with. So we like just to throw it under the ground and hide it uh, after we put our, our bubbler on. So turn it over, um, clean slate and come back in. Probably the last tool we pat, um, come back in with um, just to make sure the ground is light as possible, not compact as um, a field cultivator. Um, I think a lot of farms, you know, they, those are pretty easy to find to dig up. Find them at auctions. You can find them in the back behind old uh, equipment dealers and things like that. And you can make those things um, a use piece of equipment like new with just the right the right teeth and some of the right components without having to go um, big bucks on uh, some some new piece of equipment. So yeah, a lot of a lot of gets getting started. You don't have to have top of the line. You don't need a new planner. We've added on to our planner with just simple simple changes in coulters, closing wheels, especially for for no-till um, modifications, really, it's not. It's it's not about, I guess, you know, you know, buying whole, you know, entire new system of equipment. It's just probably modifying, in a large part, what you have. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it was mentioned yet. The combine, nothing different there whatsoever. You just probably drive a little bit slower. Weeds are a little tougher to cut if you've got them. <laughs> we generally do, but um, but uh, we just like going slow and steady, as my father-in-law would say. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's. Um, it, in, in general, yeah, a lot of the tillage equipment is is basically very similar, you know, with a you know, few exceptions. We will use the disc some some years. Sometimes we won't. We have found a disc where we have the a little more a, a sharper blade, a saber blade. It's a sunflower disc, and that seems to help at least cut through the residue if that is a, a situation we need to deal with um, the, to work the ground to just help chop things up and fit the field if. It, it's, if we're getting late in the season and we've got some poor weather and we've got to get going. Um, so we use a little bit of it all. We're trying to push things like the disc uh, to the back of the, um, to the back burner. Um, the, like I said, the mold board plow, as far as success, we'll, we'll, we'll keep using that. Um, and um, we are working on some, till, uh, some minimal tillage, strip tillage with the Rummingler strip till. We're trying to make that work We're involved with a program with uh, Equip. Um, right now. So we're going to see how that works this year with corn. And um, so slowly but surely, uh, you, you start you start figuring out what works for your operation. You start, you can you keep what you have or you move in a little different directions with modifications. But um, yeah, it's, it's not, if you're already in operation with some equipment, you've already got a good start. Starting from scratch, like Aaron said, that's a whole other ball game. And, um, but um, it's not all, it's not all that um, different in general. I saw somebody asked about the electric weeder. We actually bought one this year, um, and I've been really impressed. It's I, I keep saying, I said the Flamer was a game changer. This is really a game changer for doing um, keeping soybeans clean, keeping um, any weeds that grow above the soybeans. So I'll explain what it is. It's a pretty big generator. Ours is 120,000 watts on the back of the tractor. We're just running a, it's a fifth, you can run it from 15 to 20 foot uh, on the tool. It's a copper pipe out front of the tractor. Um, so you run that pipe right over the soybean canopy. So you're not touching the soybeans and you electrocute um, any weeds that are above the canopy, which is pigweed, um, even uh, foxtail, some, some grasses you can get. Um, and it's, um, I've never had soybeans so clean. My yields are much better in soybeans. I mean, I've, I've realized how much the weeds were robbing <laughs> yields, you know, before, um, now that they're clean this year and we had plenty of rain, but, um, but I, it's, they're fairly expensive machines, but I, I think if, you know, as you farmed organically more and more, your, I guess your weed seed bank generally goes up unless, you know, everything happens just right every year. And it, you know, there's, you're going to have those fields that 
you know, you're, you're not going to be able to keep weeds out of every year. Um, and they're, they're just low spots or trouble fields. So this, this, um, I can't clean up weeds in corn because you can't get over top of, you know, you don't have weeds getting over top of corn unless you're really doing something wrong. Um, but I, I was, I did try some sorghum too. I was able to get over top of sorghum with it. Um, grain sorghum and and soybeans um another use was somebody was saying you could use it um like i grow some food quality food grade wheat um and i'm you know as i do more no-till with the rye cover crops i'm going to be worrying about rye volunteer rye coming up in the wheat which i really don't want um but usually it, in the spring like in march or april probably probably late march it would be taller than the wheat so you could go through with this weed zapper and uh kill the rye um, that's in the wheat. So there's a few different uses for it. Um, yeah, I'll speak to the quickly to the weed zapper. We don't own one. We actually tested one uh, from a, a gentleman out in the Midwest. We're too happy with his model. And then a neighbor of ours up in Kent County, which is Fairhill Farms, Matt Fry and Ed Fry, they purchased one of their own. It was a bigger unit, a bigger generator. Mm -hmm. um, and they rigged up a tractor, a nice tractor, big 8320, uh, skinny high tires, and um, they actually did some custom work for us. And that worked really well for us instead of the investment. And just to see how it would really work too, um, we weren't certainly, we weren't really sold on it in the first place with the original one we tested. Um, but after seeing what it could do, how, how quickly they could run, it'd probably just be in the future, uh, something if we had a, you know, a field that was late or we just had a problem with, with the weather, other different factors, um, and we had some weeds coming on, we can we can have somebody we can call because uh, for them they use it for their crops and we weren't the only ones that um, they um, they did some custom work for they we were part of a loop <laughs> they were going around on Delmarva look uh, looking for looking to um, uh, do some custom work for a lot of other operations and they I think they worked it they that it was fairly successful for them and uh, but a purchase like that uh, I probably I tend to think and we'll cover it later I think is to be more on the front end. Uh, to look at the causes of weeds um, uh, rather than maybe deal with um, the symptoms of, you know, the problem with the field, maybe invest more in like a cover crop and get started uh, that way. Um, and like I said, if you do have a problem, you have somebody to call. So those tools are out there one way or another. And oh, just, I just thought of it. I did some custom flaming for another local organic farmer down the road, about 20 acres, and it, it worked real well for him and a little simple for us. We had it hooked up, ready to go. And and so, you know, always try to lend each other a, a hand and, you know, get more experience with our tools and um, the, uh, the expertise is out there and, uh, and swore too. Um, I feel like the zapper is going to probably op make me more confident, especially with no-till soybeans. My plan is next year, if I get all my rye in eventually <laughs> to do rolled rye and, <laughs> and no-till soybeans on uh, it's I was going to do all the acres, but it may not end up being that, but, um, I, I know that, you know, I'm going to get some weeds pop through that cover crop. So I have a way to come back like in August mm -hmm. and hit the field. And I did that on some no-till soybeans this year. I was able to go one time through with a weed zapper and, and take care of those few pig weed that, that came through. Um, because, you know, next year they're going to be, uh, you know, drop seed for next year. So that way I can clean up, um, you know, even if it's just a few, it's, it's worth running it through the field to, and instead of hand weeding, um, you know, if you have, I mean, more pressure than hand weeding that you would want to, you know, take a 30 acre field and hand weed it. I don't know anybody who really wants to do that if you have another tool. So, um, and uh, one thing we didn't mention, Steve has one too, a high residue cultivator. Um, if you're going to get into the, the no-till or it, I guess it wouldn't be no-till if you're actually cultivating, but if you set it right, you can cultivate real, very shallow under the, um, the residue mat and cut off, slice off the weeds that come through. Um, so I, the next thing, uh, next year, I'm going to try this. I, I'm sure Steve's heard of it, the weed slayer herbicide. Um, um, it's a OMRI approved herbicide. Um, so I'm hoping in the future that could take place of a high residue cultivating, um, you know, in that, that residue mat. Um, so we don't disturb the soil at all. It's a fairly expensive per acre. Um, you're talking like 55 to $60 an acre. But if you do a band application of it, it's, you know, you're going to be down at, you know, $40 an acre. If you could do a band, you know, where the cultivator would, would cut, um, you know, later in the season to control grass and um, pigweed. 
Um, one other question about related to equipment that I've gotten from a grower was um, as far as cleaning in between conventional and organic land, um, how much of a time commitment and effort that was and what would kind of be like the minimum size field that you would want to make that effort for to clean equipment for how many acres? Would that be um, well, I mean, it. so when you clean the equipment, it, you're supposed to have it all lined up with your organic certifier in your in your systems plan, how you're going to do it. So, I mean, I, I have in there compressed air, vacuum, uh, you know, hose the auger out with water. This is for a combine, which is mm -hmm. the hardest thing to clean. Um, I think I have it down to, I can do it in about two hours now. I mean, mm -hmm. I wouldn't call this a, a clean out for like um, foundation seed or something. We're not talking that pure, but it's as long as the certifier is okay with, you know, how you are going to do it and you, you do what you say you're going to do. Um, it's fine. I, I don't know about, you know, if you can do it in a, if even if it takes you three hours or half a day, it's, I mean, you know, if, if you have a 10 acre field, I, I guess it's worth it. I, I mean, it's you just yeah. do what you got to do. Um, yeah. Uh, speak a little more to what Aaron was saying. Yeah. For our organic uh, system plan, uh, I don't we believe we don't use any water, but of course we, for the combine, especially we open up every nook and cranny, vacuum out the yeah, air blow out and um, even scoop out if we have to dump every door uh, that we can in the combine, in the feeder house, um, uh, all the all the augers, all the elevators, um, even the, of course, the grain head too. And of course, when you're doing this, you want to try to make sure that you don't have to do it once, especially per crop. If it's for you have corn and beans and you have conventional organic, both, make sure you finish all your conventional first, <laughs> then do your organic corn, and then with your soybeans. Um, of course, you don't have to clean out if, uh, much if you're going from conventional to organic, but always, always when you're switching over to organic is when you have to do the clean out. And um, we also will do a purge. We will probably put anywhere from 25 to 50 bushels um, of grain through the, um, through the combine of organic, but not sell it as organic. We'll load it on a truck, take it down to, for us, it's Carmine's down the road. And just, just say, you know, that's, that's a little bit of sacrifice, you know, for do, to be absolutely sure, you know, I can sleep at night <laughs> knowing that I ran clean up organic grain through it and any residues, you know, anything that we missed has been taken care of. And um, one thing also to mention is neighboring fields. Just, I just thought of this. Um, we will sometimes typically take a part of a turnover of neighbors of, of another farmer's field and we're growing the same crop corn, you know, matches the rotation for corn. Even though we're typically a little bit later, there's still some possibility of drift. There's still a possibility of, it's typically cross pollination, not necessarily, unless they're very late and they've, you know, they planted in, in your, um, time frame, which is, would be pretty unusual. We've really never had that any cross pollination happen, but taking out the first swipe or two of the turn row, maybe making a 50 foot buffer, uh, taking that grain, shipping that off, uh, as conventional, just to be sure that we don't have any residues or any, um, herbicide, uh, pesticides or any carryover from the neighboring field. So that's just sometimes another, another, um, safety, uh, part of our organic systems plan procedures that we follow. Mm -hmm. So um, before we move on to the next section, we don't have um, a section for, for yields. So we'll go ahead and address this one in the chat box. Um, can organic corn and soy yields be made comparable to conventional? And uh, what would it take to accomplish something closer to that? Any, any thoughts that, that you all have on that? Um, I think soybeans can. Um, corn, I, I mean, you could if you could afford the the nitrogen sources, <laughs> that you know, the organic nitrogen sources. But I, you know, at some point you're you're gonna um, have too much expense there uh, because you know our, our nitrogen. If we we're gonna add uh, feather meal or Chilean nitrate or something, it's very expensive compared to any conventional nitrogen sources. Um, so it's it's hard to get it up there. You know. Uh, like over 200 bushels or something or it's yeah 150 is a pretty good yield to me in organic but. uh yeah i tend to I basically agree uh with what aaron said there uh yeah the soybean i think it's a little more promise uh in that um even whether it's a full season bean or even a, a double crop bean if you got some small grain and you're harvesting that and planting your beans following it um the the corn 
I think we've been making some progress on that in the last few years. We had one field in particular last year did very, very well. Uh, it, was an irrigated, it was an irrigated field, which, by the way, is a good place to start. If you have your own land, you have a little irrigation. That's a good, that's good insurance right off the bat to start on irrigated ground. Well, it's definitely more forgiving than dry land, starting with a, the dry land piece, if you have that option. But um, yet yeah, comparable to, I mean, we're not, you're not looking, if you're looking at, you know, 250, 280 bushels of irrigated uh, or anything like that right away. Um, and they said, and like Aaron pointed out, yeah, your cost of your nitrogen, you're talking to some of these other sources without dumping, you know, six tons of bushel that are on your land. You've got other sources of nitrogen that are going to cost four to six dollars per pound of nitrogen. Um, and that's pretty steep and it's hard to swallow, um, you know, in a large way anyway. So, um, uh, yeah, but we can still, you know, with, with what, and by the way, the yields on these crop budgets that Shannon already introduced, those are pretty conservative, uh, especially the beans. Um, and, um, you know, if you've got, if you're got good farmer, good cultural practices, you know, you're planting depth, you know, you know, getting in as early as you can and you're doing the right things of planting, you know, that'll show later on. And, um, your ASO. So those numbers, you know, are reflective of, you know, that's, that's a, you know, we're, you're confident that's, that's definitely going to happen, but it's certain, you know, even right now, the uh, higher profit, you know, higher numbers, uh, higher yield is, is, um, not reflected in those, in those, um, uh, spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. So it's, I also will add, I've heard Steve Graff talk about this, that um, in some cases, another question associated with this is, does it really matter? You know, if your profit margins at the end of the day are as good as, or if not better than conventional corn, then the yield decrease, you know, what, what, what does that matter? You know, maybe there's the question of looking, looking at it differently that is, highest yields, what we're looking for, is it just, you know, a decent profit margin? Um, so I don't, I don't know if, like, in your experience, you find that that to be the case. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're always looking at, um, yeah, you always look at, yeah, the, it's the profit margin, it's the, it's the, it's the, you know, you're in this to make a living, and, you know, you know, uh, every farmer has their numbers, and they know their, their margins, where they are, where they're gaining, where they're losing. And um, even I think uh, for us, if going from a, we've done plenty of points more, but a lot more no-till with the beans or different uh, uh, variety of cover crops with no-till beans, uh, knowing that, you know, even if trying something new, going uh, from conventional yield to no-till yield, even if they're the same, but I spent less time in the field, I've gained something. And if it's the same weeds, but I got the same, I had to gain something. I'd gain, you know, a handle on managing something else. And I can use that as a jump off point. You know, I was able to spend more time managing my corn, which is our highest um, profit margin. And uh, so looking at things as even workflow and labor, um, you know, vic victories there, you know, something in some things, it's hard to put a dollar on, you know, just my, my time alone, you know, farmer's time isn't worth anything to them, but it is. I, I can't put a, yeah, I can't put a dollar value on it, but I know when it is. <laughs> and, um, yeah, if I can be doing something else and putting my resources and effort and energy, uh, into something, uh, you know, and letting something else go, but knowing it's going to be, you know, at least comparable to what I've been doing before, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And I think that producers are always reinvesting in the farm. So you have that profit margin and there's that, um, whether it's, looking for additional land or it's um, improving equipment or um, changing a system or, or changing the machinery used. So there's always that reinvestment in the farm. Yeah, to me, it's, um, I, I don't know, I was, when I started farming, I've been trying to make a living at it. Um, I, I just didn't want to go out and rent a bunch of land. I wanted to kind of stick on, I knew I had 400 acres of family land to transition or whatever. And, um, you know, there's no way I'm going to make a living on conventional grain on that 400 acres. It's not, not feasible anymore unless, you know, something changes in the world market. <laughs> but uh, with organic, I, I can do that. And we're, we're kind of in a, I'm out on a neck in an area, you know, where I, you know, I have rivers around me. I can't go rent a bunch of land easily. Uh, it's just not a, not a lot of rent land around us. I think Steve may be in a different area where they're more central to a lot of good land. Um, but I, I wanted to keep it small and 
I, you know, organic was the way to do that. It's, it's more of a lifestyle thing for me, not running equipment all over the country and trying to, you know, rent 2000 acres of, you know, and do conventional grain. Um, I can, I can manage, you know, maybe 400 acres on my own. Um, and, you know, have some more, give some more attention to each acre, like Steve was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we, um, we've dropped our acreage a little bit in the last uh, several years, not by much, but we've noticed just the difference instead of running out to Timbuktu on a certain farm, we've gained a farm and lost a farm. And, you know, the extra, the extra, and it wasn't a great farm either, uh, to be honest, but the extra work putting in that farm, you know, we were losing it someplace else. We kind of put a lot of effort into a um, piece of ground that isn't you know, giving it back. You know, you can probably stay closer to home or your home farm in Aaron's case and do a better job and be, you know, very, very um, highly manage everything and be able to respond to something, uh, weed control or just a planting window, harvest window, cover crop window, you know, much more quickly and effectively, and then have a, um, have that carry over the next year or later in the season. And you'll see the, you'll see the benefits from it. So, yeah. Um, I, I don't like the idea of yeah, scattering myself all across, uh, yeah, Queen Anne's County or even north or south or, or west of here, or east, excuse me, the Caroline County for land. I, I probably take uh, Aaron's philosophy to heart to just do a better job managing what we've really got on the home farm. Do we have any audience questions? Feel free to unmute. Um, oh, here's one in the chat. Are there any new crops that you are interested in adding to the rotation, sorghum, for instance, but for which there are barriers that would need to be addressed in order to do so? Um, well, uh, to sorghum, I know that that was an example, but I'm trying to get. I, I would like to do more sorghum, but this year the the turkeys found it, and there was no sorghum left. So mm -hmm. I, where I I can't grow, I I know I can't grow white sorghum anymore, at least, which is what the market wants in organic. Purdue, I know, has, you know, reached out and they're trying to get more people to grow sorghum. But I mean, unless it's a horror, you know, your worst deer deer fields, if you have a lot of fields that you know, deer eat all your other crops, sorghum might be an option for you. But it just doesn't compare economically to to corn or soybeans or to corn would be the one you're looking at. But um, but uh, yeah, other organic crops. Um, I, I was trying some dry beans this year. Um, that would be a food grade crop and they, they did well. I just did less than an acre of each, but they were pinto beans and black beans. Um, you know, obviously there's no, you know, market for like a trailer load of them anywhere close by, but, um, you know, there's people that'll buy bulk bags of stuff like that. So there are, you know, maybe we don't grow them as well as they can in Michigan, but, um, you know, they, they did fine for me this year. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of other, um, crops and I'm going more towards the food grade on my, on my wheat, which is, you know, a third of my rotation, third of my acres is pretty much all going to food grade now, uh, for the winter and winter and spring small grains. Um, but then, so I'm trying to add some legumes in there, you know, the summer annual crops too. Um, so we'll, it's fun to you know play around with different stuff and be on a small enough scale that I, I can. And I, I feel like I need to, to make, you know, make a little bit more money on those acres in addition to the feed grains. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. What Aaron's saying, you know, going, you know, trying something new yet. Yeah, don't go too big. <laughs> you don't want to, you know, something you're not used to not um, haven't really dealt with before. That's, it's a good way, a good approach. And I think, you know, he's able to find, you know, a, a, a niche, uh, market uh, for it and you know, not adding too much to deal with, you know, even if that is a problem, uh, but we did try um, and they do promote it as part of any organic system rotation is uh, forage. And we did have a grass, only about nine acres, a uh, grass alfalfa mix, although, uh, and um, always had buyers for it, square, but uh, did mostly square bales. And of course, a lot of labor uh, with small square bales, but uh, there's always seems to be the market uh, for it. Always, we were always able to get rid of it. Uh, doing three, four cuttings, even though probably could have been five or six, but you know, either you focus on nine acres of hay or a thousand acres of small grain or uh, of grain crops. Uh, you know, one thing has to uh, take over, and um, you have to uh, get on with taking care of the rest of the farmland. But we found that even did it for four years, um, including that, discovered that you know there is a market for it, and um, the square bales, even. Uh, not even even if it wasn't direct sales to buyers taking it to uh, taking it to market if you could do it right do it well enough 
uh, to an auction, um, it still could sell uh, fairly well uh, there. And uh, also found uh, you know some ancillary benefits of what came after just put it back in the crop rotation. We noticed the, the increased improved health in the field and some better um, uh, soil structure, uh, fewer weeds, and a few other benefits too that they're still kind of carrying over and that was three or four years ago so it was uh, kind of good to actually see it you know they, they promote it and uh, and they say this is you know this is a good idea it's just hard to deal with hay but having done it you know it's something maybe we could enter in again um into in the future and know that you know got somewhere to go that's probably the biggest thing is and knowing that trying something new you do have a market for it somebody's out there waiting uh, to buy it and um yeah, rather than having just a big, big question mark, that's that's a pretty big dive. And dive into something, a big step without that knowledge, that information. Mm -hmm. okay. I have a few more questions um, related to this, and you touched on it some already. I'll just read the two questions. So, what other organic crops would make alternatives to grains in the organic market? And then, uh, what are the markets for the edible grains? Um, well, the, I guess in the Mid Atlantic that edible grains are more on, you know, a super sack, like one ton at a time scale. So if you're willing, and I'm doing some of that, willing to deal with, you know, small scale like that, um, there, there is, you know, there is a market you're, I mean, you're going to have to, there's a network of people that, you know, talk and it's, you can find it, but you're probably not going to sell a trail load, you know, in Maryland, I know to any, for any food grade, um, you know, at one time, I, I know there's some mills and Steve may have mar talked to some people, but up in Pennsylvania, I know there's some mills that will buy trail loads of food grade wheat. But then again, you're going to have to sit on that wheat, get it tested for, um, you know, vomitoxin, uh, falling numbers. They're going to want everything to be just right to pay you that premium. Um, and it may, you know, maybe $5 a bushel instead of $10 a bushel for wheat, which, you know, is worth for a trail load that's worth fooling with um or, or more um but then again you have to you know um do everything right like you want to plant your wheat after soybeans not after corn so you don't have the the risk of you know, the less risk of scab in the field um and then you're going to have to be able to store it in the summer and not let bugs get in it while somebody runs tests on it and then then they may buy it from you so that it's kind of hit or miss i think on the on the food grade uh, yeah, we have, we've done our own, some of our own cover crop with small grains in the past. And even, uh, the, our example using, uh, our rye crop, we grow anywhere between 40 and 50 acres of rye and try to use it and recycle it as our own uh, cover crop, but also sell the straw, uh, Fairhill Farms again up in Kent County. Um, they're always looking for it. They, I think they go as far as the Carolinas and haul it back themselves. They, they do all the traveling themselves and that would be a kind of a little extra, um, a little extra bit of income or at least cash flow for the operation if you're thinking about budgets and your and and what's coming in and what's going out um and really it's something it's a very simple thing adjustment to make if you're not worried about what you're taking off of the straw say in terms of the nutrients maybe some potassium maybe a little bit of phosphorus unless you want to take those things out or maybe phosphorus if you have, it's a little high in your soil um we were able to find somebody nearby with a baler all we had to do was make an adjustment on the back of the combine to just dump it instead of spread it out and chaff it like combine normally does and it's a half an hour job to adjust the combine put it in a row and then call somebody say it's ready to come and bail it and even uh Fairhill farms they came and picked it up and did all the handling so a lot of our hands was very easy and you know that was a little little extra income it's not top dollar if you want top dollar for those kind of products you're gonna have to store it yourself which means you gotta have a place to do it and you've got to do all the labor well you know leg work running around making calls getting prices um, sometimes it's just having that like I said before, having that market, that peace of mind, and you know, knowing that you're gaining a little bit, and but you know, you didn't have to do a whole lot for it. It's it's um, it's just a, it's just a little something that you can you can add on to uh, in the course of your year, in the course of your season, um, and uh, make something work. But uh, yeah, yeah, vomitoxin is a very big issue in small grains, and uh, and just going out being a transitional operation if you're trying to do transitional small grains that would be a very tricky uh proposition trying to um try to sell those or try to keep keep the uh, uh scab off uh off that crop especially with our weather and if there are options for spraying and 
uh, some organic products. They're not cheap either. If you do your own spraying, you know, the equipment, that's better. Uh, but still, um, it's just, it's a bigger risk when you're in transition, especially small grains and, and, and trying to, you know, trying to make it work. It's just, it's just a tough crop uh, to get right. And, and the germination to boot too, even if it's just per se cover crop seed and not for uh, food consumption. So then Aaron, with your small grains that you grow, you do that in the fields that have already finished the transition process and not necessarily during uh, yeah yes there's no for the food grade it's it's just i mean um yeah because the transitional fields are feed feed definitely feed for me feed grains and uh mm -hmm. you know the the miller i sell the wheat to doesn't he's not certified organic but i think he likes to you know mention that it was <laughs> grown certified organic even though he might not be allowed to do that <laughs> usda probably doesn't like that but it, it's anyway it's neither here nor there but um um yeah, so they're all organic. And, and so as far as, you know, if you're growing one variety of wheat for, let's just say you were trying the food grade, you have a lot of risk in that um, because it's going to flower at the same time. And if you get a big rain event, you know, right before flowering or at flowering, you, you could, you're you probably going to get scab here because there's not, I mean, there may be, there are some fungicides, but I, I'm sure they're not as effective as the uh, con, what the conventional guys can use on wheat. I know they're not. So um, I've no, I don't spray anything on wheat. I probably should look into some organic fungicides, but I've um, never have. Um, so, but what I do instead, I'm, I'm growing like 10 different varieties of, you know, spelt, wheat, rye, emmer, you know, even the wheat, there's, you know, um, all different timings. They're, they're all going to mature at different times because I'm growing so many different varieties, which on one side is a pain, but they're, you know, the, the, the premiums there to do it. And then, you know, I, I don't, my risk is spread out. Um, you know, I might get scab on one or two of those varieties and have to sell it for feed wheat. Um, so it's, that, that's kind of how I manage that. This kind of ties well into a question here that says, um, a farmer I spoke with recently who has a small number of acres in transitional grain offered, well, I guess this wouldn't be in small grains, but nevertheless, in transitional grain, offered that he doesn't have the time to prioritize these acres while still managing a high number of conventional acres. Um, so the transitional acres don't get as much attention as they probably need. Any advice that you would give to a farmer in that situation? Well, I guess it depends on, you know, if he wants to be serious about transitioning those those transitional years are important to it's you know you're starting with probably with fairly weed free fields so you know if he's serious about moving into organic i guess he needs to find a way to um to do that to uh, i mean i guess the other option is i know i know steve can speak to this about bill used to do all his transitional acres is like drilled drilled beans and rolled rye and a re really low input system um, and that may be something he could do instead of, you know, tilling and cultivating. And um, Well, the, the key is, and it's already been stated, is this is small acres. Um, just get your feet wet. You know, I said it's no sense in trying to go, go big because you'll probably go home. <laughs> um, it's uh, what, you know, I do understand what the, the farmer operator is saying, you know, within our organic system, when I try something new, a new technique or method, I'm only going to do a few acres on one side of the field where it's real easy. You know, it's, it's a nice, easy round. I got a place to turn and it just makes sense logistically and with the, the layout of the field. But, you know, when things, you know, when we get grinding, we get really working. Unfortunately, that does tend to, yes, go by the wayside. Uh, but still what Aaron said is, is correct. I mean, if you do want to become, if you do want to be a serious um, in serious organic uh, production yet yeah, you do have to put the time in and you know i don't know what how many acres we're, we're speaking about here the what the farmer is speaking about but you try to do it in such a way when, when we do a program for organic we want to try a new cover crop a mix we wanted to try clover with the rye so so they could be more you know, synergistic together and one could buttress the other if one didn't do well and it's worked well before but Doing a couple acres, you don't pay attention to it. It should probably be, you know, um, start with a field. If you have irrigation, make sure it's under irrigation. If you've got, uh, you know, it's a fairly decent field. I wouldn't just start with your, you know, the last field you get to every year and it's down in a hole somewhere because you're probably not going to do very well uh, with it. 
uh, you, you probably want to start on something you know what you know you have a field that you know is pretty productive Aaron mentioned weed free or low weeds you know get started with a good um, cover crop program with the rye and beans you know a lot less a lot fewer inputs uh, going on there um, even if you don't want to use the rye still um, a few inputs right away because conventional farmers you know trying to deal with um, with rye right right away I think it they back off a little bit and, you know, we've done conventional beans that this year did very well. We had a good planting season for them. They were actually our best beans uh, this year. Um, but of course, on the budget side, you know, probably a little bit less than the no-till beans, you know, with those budgets that Shannon provides. But still, you know, they can do, they can do well. And they're not, there's, they're, they can be comparable many years. If you can, that's what I have to say about that. Thank you guys. Um, so we have, jumping around a little bit here, there are two more questions in the chat box, and then we'll switch back over to, to what we had on the um, agenda. So uh, one question is for Shannon. Um, how would a crop budget for organic food grade wheat differ from organic feed grade wheat? So um, uh, I, I, I'm guessing there's different varieties you know, you may have a, a special variety that, that you would be purchasing um, that would meet the food grade interest of whoever the buyer is. Um, I think that uh, we do struggle, at least here on the Eastern Shore, with our quality of small grains, and that may be a big issue. Um, I mean, even our, uh, you know, our conventionally grown wheat when it's delivered often gets discounted or sent back because of the quality um, or, or wet springs and the type of wheat that we grow here um, can be a little bit difficult um, for the quality standards that uh, food grade wants to meet at least on a large scale. I don't know Aaron or Stephen what your experiences are with that. Uh, yeah, they're they're gonna want varieties that are probably not bred for here, <laughs> is is another issue. Um, a, a lot of well, uh, it yeah, I mean it could it's probably gonna be a hard wheat, you know, which there's very you know I think Virginia Tech has bred some recently, but um, that hopefully have some scab resistance. Um, but if it has like low scab resistance, you they really shouldn't plant it. <laughs> it it's not even you would really wouldn't want to do that here. Um, because you're way behind the, the game already because you can't can't spray it or or there's few products you can spray that work um so yeah it, it's definitely going to be hit or miss i think um and you they would have to be prepared to send it to food uh, to feed grade i, I think kind of if it could just be icing on the cake if if the buyer up in pennsylvania or new york wherever the mill would be would would accept it Yeah, no, uh, we haven't dealt with the uh, food grade market actually at all. But uh, Aaron, I guess, imagine also, I mean, some other factors about the grain, maybe like protein content. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it is one important thing is something you have to be aware of. And I think you're, you deal with a lot of different um, seeding rate. You probably have a different seeding rate in population, or at least um, your seeding rate bushes breakthrough, I guess, must change a little bit. You have to be careful, a little more careful with the fertility uh, with the food grade. Yeah, um, well, Fertility, yeah, yeah. If you're trying for protein, you probably want to. If you're using Chilean nitrate as a, a top dressing on the wheat, you may want. I think you need to put it on later. You know, so you're getting, you're not, you're not putting the, the nitrogen out for to get yield. You're putting it towards protein, um, and there's a lot of timing is, is involved there. Um, and then, you know, if they want, if it needs to be soft wheat, um, which is you know, there's more varieties to choose from here. They want the protein low, <laughs> so you you got to make sure you don't put the pro the nitrogen on too late. So, in, and like a, if it's a soft white wheat, they want it really low, like for um, pastry flour. So like 5% protein and, you know, there's, so anyway, we're talking from 5% to 13% protein. You, you've got to manage it accordingly. I mean, the varieties are kind of bred for, for that, but you can, you can screw up on that end of it too. And then put a lot of money out in nitrogen at the wrong time. You know, Chilean nitrates at least $3 a, a pound of available in. So you know, that's, that's pretty expensive. You don't want to just throw it out there at the wrong time. 
you know, or four dollars, you know, probably if you're spread by one of a local agri service uh, mm-hmm. dealer, or something like that. Yeah, but uh, that application timing, just real quick, you know, you're probably looking at up to three applications from our experience with just um, just uh, just harvesting for grain for uh, for feed. Uh, one in the fall, a top trip, probably 15 pounds, uh, probably the Chilean nat- Chile Chile nitrate, there we go, product. And then two more in the spring, probably right at, right after March 1st, as soon as you can get in there. And then another uh, top dress uh, when it's really greening up, probably sometime in April. Mm-hmm. I usually do, well, I start with mid-February. If they if MDA allows, usually they release that. You know, Down here, it's, you know, we think we Valentine's Day is, is just a tiny shot of Chilean to get tillering started. And then, then chicken manure in first of March, you know, as soon as I can get it on and then uh, one to two more spoon feedings of Chilean. So it's, it's a lot of trips over the field. Uh, but you know, that time of year I have time to do it generally, you know, it's not, not too busy right then. So it, it works for me. And, and then the heritage weeds, you don't use any extra nitrogen, a, a little bit of chicken litter is all they can handle. They'll, they'll grow tall and lodge. If you put, um, they, they just don't have the stalk, the stem structure that <laughs> the modern weeds do. So um, but you know, a, a trailer load of heritage wheat is probably, you know, going to be hard to find a market for all that at once. So generally those are more in, you know, super sacks at a time. Uh, and then I saw the artisanal flour. I'll move right to that. Cause, um, I, I assume, I mean, I'm selling wheat to a, I don't know if he's an artisanal miller or not, which you call that, but I know some of the, you know, the, the buyers of his flour that is my wheat is. Um, yeah, you know, they're marketing their bread as artisanal. So, so that would be a yes. Uh, well, as far as uh, answering about the artisanal flour, well, probably you know boils down to uh, economy of scale uh, for us, and uh, we're just probably not at the moment set up for um, you know probably the the, the demand or the quantities um, the uh, artisanal operation might be interested in. You know, maybe. Uh, several hundred pounds or something like that. You know, when you've got a, you've got a 9670 combine with a 30 foot head on it, you know, when you're trying to be harvesting a quarter acre, half acre, you, um, you know, you kind of wonder if it's, it's worth doing it at that scale. Not that it couldn't happen. Uh, quick example, you know, just our, our grain, our corn grain twice, but twice in the past eight years, I, I think. 10 years since I've been here, there's been two distilleries that have taken a load of corn, a tractor trailer load, so roughly a thousand bushels. Um, and, uh, you know, I think just from word of mouth and uh, things like that, you get a call kind of out of the blue, they're looking for it, and then you've got it, it's ready to go, it's dry. And we, sh- we shipped one off a little earlier this fall to a distillery in Baltimore. And um, they said they'll send us a bottle in five years when it's ready. <laughs> but things like that do pop up. We supply a little corn down to the Y mill, they got a little uh, a mill down there. Uh, just south of us here. Um, and, uh, you know, so little things like that happen, but we're really generally built for tra- for tractor trailer trucks. Um, and that's our scale, tractor trailer trucks and uh, bulk loads. So sometimes those those niche those niche uh, products, heritage or um, certain wheats, uh, those grains, you know, uh, you've got to really be set up for, for uh, more like Aaron is um, um, for that kind of scale and that size. So. Yeah, I put in a bunch of, um, I've gone around and bought old uh, chicken house feed hoppers and I have a row of eight of them. They hold about a trail load each. So that's, that's working well for, and I'm trying to get as the miller grows and other markets grow for the wheat, it's, it'd be nice to think I could fill one of those with each variety. Um, but then, you know, the heritage varieties, we don't need that much of them. So I still have to find, you know, bulk bag storage for them. And then the bug, the bugs love bulk bags. So <laughs> the, <laughs> the grain weevils and things. So we're, we're looking even at it start, starting like cold storage, like a 50 degree kind of cold storage for some of these grains, like a, a room with a cool bot that's insulated um, that, that stops insect activity at 50. So we're for this year, we're, we're looking into that. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Very good. Uh, so there's a question here for Aaron on what size spoon for Chilean nitrate, as in <laughs> the rate do you spoon feed it at? Uh, well, in, in mid February, late February, it, it green up anyway. I'm probably putting out about 15 to 18 pounds of available in just a small shot to get it started. Yeah. Um, I think my total in would be mm-hmm. around 50 pounds of Chilean total. So if I do two more, splits um 
I don't know, maybe, you know, 20, 20 pounds. Oh no, I guess. Yeah. Um, maybe another one that's like, um, I don't know, 20 pounds and 20 pounds, something like that. So pretty small, small spoons <laughs> at a time, just because, you know, it's pretty, pretty volatile and can be, can leach away um, pretty quickly. So you want to want to get in, get it out there and spread the risk, get it in small amounts on the wheat so it can use it, you know, fairly quickly and not just have it sitting there or, well, it can take it, take it up from the soil. Uh, yeah. And I mean, we've used the chili nitrate product before, um, in smaller amounts too. We try not to for any crop in general. Uh, a quick example, we have done peas on the farm, uh, vegetable, uh, vegetables. So uh, peas in the spring. And, uh, we usually start with a little bit of, uh, chili and nitrate uh, put on top, but then usually use another product, usually come in uh, bulk bags or totes of there's pro uh, products uh, organic and nature safe. They have these certain either uh, feather meal blends, blood meal uh, blends with, with litter uh, blends. And uh, you're talking about maybe uh, uh, probably a total of maybe hundred pounds of nitrogen for, for peas, sometimes maybe a little bit more. Small grains, Aaron's about right on about 50 pounds, sometimes maybe 60. 15 in the fall, 15 at early on, and maybe 30. Uh, at yeah, plus end. the litter. I, I do the two tons of litter oh, too. Yeah. So that's, but so. that doesn't get used a little tiny bit of that gets used. It's, you know. Yeah. I think we, we have tried the litter before. We're too happy with it. And the response at least, you know, since put on the fall, well, it's getting cold and there's no microbial activity in the spring, same story. You're warming up. It's still uh, soil microbes aren't really coming along. And by the time they are, your crops already, you know, getting is probably, and antithesis and it's filling out and uh, probably not getting the, for us anyway, the, um, that useful mineralized nitrogen um, you know, right away. So yeah, those more immediate, uh, uh, those more immediate available um, forms of nitrogen, Chilean um, blood meals, feather meals, things like that. Not necessarily, maybe not feather meal, maybe the blood meals. Um, they, they tend to um, be totally available probably a course of six to eight weeks after application. So it seems like maybe this is a good time to jump back into the, the questions that we had um, and the nutrient management and fertility questions that you had brought up, um, Stephen, when we were thinking about this session. Um, so you had listed some considerations. Do you feel ready to take it from that section? That's, that sounds fine. Okay. Um, well, since you kind of put that together, I, maybe you can just take us through what your thoughts were there. Yeah, I guess just maybe one by one and Aaron, make sure you, know, you jump in um, whenever you see fit. Um, but um, yeah, for fertility management and your, your main fertility um, is usually for your corn crown uh, and the, one of the cheapest and uh, most available forms around on the Eastern shore for us is the poultry litter. And um, it, it, I think costing anywhere between, i figure it out here for, for us applied and, and on the field, the dollar 16 to dollar 40 per pound um, and having a lot of different micronutrients um, with it to come along with it, with uh, some of that fertilizer carryover, calcium, magnesium too, and of course there's uh, phosphorus, potassium. You get a good, pretty close ratio with the phosphorus and, excuse me, the potassium and the nitrogen. You're looking for roughly a one-to-one -one ratio there in any fertility program, whether you're using litter or not, and poultry litter does have that. Um, your calcium, magnesium, I mentioned, um, will help keep your pH up. We kind of tend, we tend to see in a lot of our land, since it's all in the corn soybean rotation, one year you get litter, the next year with the soybeans you don't put any on. Um, but it seems like that poultry litter is keeping the pH bust uh, buttressed up a little bit um, from the frequent applications, not to mention even um, the secondary nutrients like uh, sulfur, uh, which are uh, pretty important. You know, we have tried with uh, some gypsum amendments on some fields as part of a, a equip program uh, and just to see if it would make any difference if, see if maybe sulfur or if it did anything else uh, for our fertility it really didn't so it seems like the poultry takes care of those things um, uh, and a lot of those uh, macro micronutrient needs of the, of the of the crop and even the carryover um, uh, and as far as uh, maybe that timing of those applications um, Aaron was touching on some of it. He likes putting a little bit on in the spring, um, none in the fall, which I agree with, unless you can get it very, very early. If mm -hmm. in a situation where you fallow the field from say a, a small grain harvest in June and um, 
we wanted to do, I don't know, another small grain uh, uh, cover crop uh, for harvest. If you can get it in probably by October 1st, grilled poultry litter on, you want to get some value out of that poultry litter while there's still, uh, soil's still somewhat warm and some of that manure can mineralize. That's, uh, that, that'd be my cutoff. I can't, I don't have any research data to back it up, but uh, given the trends and just the temperatures and the moisture and, and growing conditions, um, um, unless you can get it in early, I probably wouldn't bother with, with litter um, in the fall. But uh, spring uh, for spring can make certainly make sense if the small grain in Aaron's case uh, doesn't take it up. He's following with beans. I know the beans certainly well. We've had a situation there before. We've had a cornfield with a poor cutworm uh, section of the field, 15 acres, tried two, re uh, two replants of corn, didn't take. Put the soybeans on, they, they took, but um, even they were being late, the soybeans found that nitrogen and, and took it up. So if you are putting it on in the spring, you can get something um, uh, back from it uh, with a, a double crop uh, rotation of situation, um, small grain to soybeans. It certainly, you know, it certainly can help. And um, uh, especially if you are going to be putting on more than one application uh, every other year, like we do, you definitely want to have the crops there to take out for example, the phosphorus, and leads me right into my uh, point I wanted to make about the phosphorus balance and the um, phosphorus management tool regulations uh, with uh, the state state regs and the rules. Um, I had to get make a call this morning to Howard Callahan, um, and he uh, to just explain to me to make sure I understood what the, the final ruling will be in 2022 when it's fully implemented. We're coming to 2021 season, and it's nearly there. It started back in 2017, I believe. And it's been a staggered approach for operations, but depending on your soil fertility and your phosphorus levels, um, any of these phosphorus fertility index values of 150 or above, you're usually bumped into a high category, especially in the Eastern shore. There's a lot of water around here, a lot of artificial drainage, a lot of streams, uh, ditches, tiles, everything uh, like that. Um, so it's, unless you're, you're sectioning out 500, you know, three, 400, 500, uh, sec uh, feet of fields and sections away from streams, you know, managing that, managing that differently, you're going to be stuck in a, in a high risk category. And well, at least with organic, you have uh, a few options. Um, generally, with a conventional operation, a grain operation, if you were using litter already, which many do, um, you would be, you'd be hard pressed to find, uh, be able to put any of that on, any phosphorus uh, on at all, since phosphorus does come with the litter. Um, what you're looking at is, uh, so zero, so with the, the regs, if you are in this high category as a conventional operation, you're, you're stuck. You have to find something else. You guess you have to find a synthetic fertilizer, more than likely. Uh, with the organic though, you're still allowed organic uh, organic amendments, uh, poultry litter obviously being one of those. And I believe the rule is uh, you can apply it uh, so that the subsequent two crops uh, will be re uh, removing whatever you put on. So the phosphorus removal, for those crops, uh, those, those two subsequent crops um, has to match whatever you put on. And uh, to give a quick example, um, if you're applying, if you do what we do, corn and, and soybeans on dry land, uh, assuming 110 bushels yield for the, the corn, 35 bushels for the beans, um, you're removing about uh, 80 pounds of P205. And as far as uh, tons of litter, I think that works out to roughly about a ton and a half to ton and three quarter uh, poultry litter that you could apply in that that sequence in that rotation. So instead of zero, at least you have something. And not to mention the fact that uh, being organic, you use a lot of cover crops and legumes uh, to try to grow at least half your nitrogen, and which it is possible. And we can we'll get to that, I guess, uh, shortly here with some of the yep. questions. It's, so I, I may not be putting uh, poultry litter on my wheat anymore. <laughs> that may be where I, where it has to go. Right? That's probably is definitely not going to go away on the corn. So if, if in those three years. My three-year rotation, if I can put two and a half tons on corn, then maybe I won't put it on wheat and just use the, um, the, the mined materials that are readily available. Uh, yeah, um, I think, I, I, think I, I did try to uh, run a few numbers and, and figure out yeah, what you're, you're getting. If uh, three tons of litter general will give you 150 pounds of P205, and according to the phosphorus management tool, that's all available <laughs> mm -hmm. um, at yeah, once. Well. And um, trying to get rid of that 150 pounds is, is pretty tough with the corn, just the corn soybean rotation, especially on dry land. Um, irrigated, maybe not, not as tricky. You have, you have a little higher um, yield potential there with corn and even the beans. Um, but adding a cover crop though, for harvest, and it, 
if it works out, you can take the straw away, like I had mentioned earlier, uh, the better you're getting pretty close to that P balance. And that's what you have to think about, I think, since litter is such a main, um, at, least, at least for our operation, um, you know, a big, uh, biggest fertility option besides growing our, our nitrogen, our legumes. Uh, we have to be very, uh, very conscious of that. And we soil sample uh, every year uh, to, to monitor our, our levels. And it plus keeps an eye on the other micronutrients, especially for lime and, um, and even our uh, soil organic matter, which as Aaron mentioned, you know, is pretty low around here, um, down here with our sandier loams and those soils. You know, if you're up at uh, one and a half percent, you're doing pretty good. You know, gold probably for us would be 2%. So um, maybe someday. Uh, but um, yeah, so you get that about two to one ratio of that available phosphorus uh, to your available nitrogen per ton of litter. So it's about a, so two to one. And um, with corn beans rotation, you got about a net of 20 pounds uh, phosphorus, P2O5 added. But a corn barley beans rotation, just for example, the net of, you get a net of five to 10 pounds phosphorus removed, um, at least by the numbers anyway. Um, uh, that depends whether you want to bale that straw or not. But uh, one way or another, you got three, three harvests um, um, of grain, corn beans, and, and small grain. And that'll at least keep you about, that should keep you balanced, um, at least in the, as I figured it for a, for a uh, dry land situation. Um, cost too, um, generally, I think I brought this up already, the cost per pound of nitrogen, the dollar sixteen to dollar forty. That is relatively cheap in the organic world, um, although at, um, I don't think that can beat um, our legume uh, cost of, per pound of nitrogen, which is down below a dollar, probably around uh, about 66 cents uh, per pound. So if you can do it right, and there's ways to do it, um, it's already, you know, with the aerial applications and, and the t tools we're using every day, the conventional farmers are using every day with their drills, um, it's certainly a, a something that would be a, a quick, easy um, uh, a change and a possibility, especially a way to save money, um, like a cheap way to, uh, to uh, fertilize, uh, fertilize your corn, especially. Um, do, are there any questions so far? I just I better stop. I get rambling and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I have a couple questions that um, some are in the chat and some came ahead of time on the registration. Um, let's see. I guess we'll we'll touch on well, I'll jump to this one. Um, we had some people interested in controlling pests, so diseases and pest pressures, um, and they were particularly interested in wheat and small grains. Um, but just in general, and I know we don't have too much time left. What would be some your experience controlling pests in organic, and how big of an issue is that for production? Aaron, do you want to cover the small grain? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't do it anything besides, um, you know, I, I don't do any sprays or, I mean, it's a, a three-year rotation. I haven't seen, uh, well, I mean, pests and stored grains, a whole other issue, but I think they, they're probably addressing the field, like uh, cereal leaf beetle. And, um, and I, I think if it's a good rotation, um, I haven't seen any, like, cereal leaf beetle issues. Um, I haven't seen an an aphid issue, uh, you know, in the, I've been growing small grains for a while organic and, um, it's, um, that, that's not been an issue. Um, mm -hmm. you know, weeds, winter weeds can be an issue if you, you know, don't get a good start in the fall and try to smother the winter weeds. Um, so I don't, but it's, I guess they're talking about, um, insect pests or, or um, insect, and they did mention disease as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I, again, I don't, I've never even, I, I've heard that there's some organic fungicides out there, like Steve was saying, but I, I've never tried them. So I, I couldn't speak to that. Uh, My guess yeah. is they're, they're not going to be, you're going to have to time it exactly right and probably do three or four <laughs> sprays if it's organic. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like a, um, presario or something in the conventional world. Uh, yeah. Well, um, yeah, the timing of those sprays, yeah, it is definitely crucial. And if there's any question, of course, you'd be paying extra close attention to the weather and the forecast. And they even do have disease um, forecast models out there uh, for, you know, they extend out maybe uh, next uh, a week or so. And there's websites um, that you can use to see, you know, if you're near that critical time where you're in boot stage and you think you're going to be, uh, your small grains are going to be flowering. You do have, you have these tools that will show the, 
you know, with the past history of the disease is, where it might be in the next you know, several days, and you'd be able to make maybe an economical decision about what you want to do. But just shooting from the hip with a small grain, if, if you get into it, I'd probably be inclined to put on, be preemptive about it, probably put something on um, just ahead, ahead of um, either the weather, uh, possible weather event, or just, just uh, probably anyway, put it on the uh, just, just put on even if the weather looks good um, just to cover myself a little bit i think you're better off being preemptive with these organic products than being retroactive and once the disease is there it's really hard to control them once they're there but i think you can do a better job praying ahead of time and keeping them out in the first place i think they do a better job that way um, at least what i've uh, heard a little bit from some of the uh, few other uh, farmers i've talked to and even uh, some uh, webinars and things on uh, on small grains and they do, they're starting to trickle in with the, uh, you know, uh, plots and things with organic products, uh, still mostly focused on conventional uh, sprays, but there are those those uh, products out there and some have been using them and I, there's some contacts I use um, uh, in the ag service realm that, that know a little bit about them. So they're out there. It's just, um, I probably be more inclined to cover my bases um, with, with those pests. But quickly about, um, besides small grain, we have had armyworms before and we do have uh, comp uh, chemicals for those. And trust is, uh, is the one that we use. Uh, it's, it's not a cheap one, but it does do the job. So it is, you know, you know, you got to get a scout out there. Make sure you have somebody you can call the scout if you do it. You think you have a problem, and they can actually they can crawl between fields. We've had ones crawl from over barley to corn, uh, just marching along like an army, like the name denotes. And uh, we were able to take care of them though by flying on the application of uh, of N trust. Uh, which is a spinosad product, and it seems to really take care of them and save the corn. So um, there are there are solutions, especially for those worms, and in many cases early on. But you still you want to have somebody uh, a good a handle on you know scouting and what the pest level really is, where that threshold is, because we do a pest all the time. We generally don't spray it all unless we know there's a problem. We call we call somebody say you be out here and they're out here and uh, that day or the next. And you know, give you an answer. But uh, generally, we're not worried about it. We don't put anything else in the corn or the soybeans. Um, uh, you got to be organic is um, uh, tolerating tolerating a pest up to mm -hmm. a certain limit, of course. But we're not into eliminating pests. We're managing. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, a couple other miscellaneous questions: Is there a Maryland or regional group, um, official or unofficial, of or for organic growers other than M-O-F-F-A, that's MOFFA. Uh, not that I'm aware of, I, Steve. I, I don't. Uh, no, unfortunately, I'm not that uh, okay. I'm aware of either. Um, but uh, I don't know, Need, did you, would you be aware of any um, other groups? For grain specifically, not really. Um, though i guess in some ways we're we're forming one here <laughs> well the co the common grain alliance i just saw it's re regional that would be they're, they're more into food grade stuff but in fa fairly small scale sure yeah that's right for 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 the um, specialty um for both brewers and um local uh um wheat and um specialty sort of small grains yeah um so uh, Lane was saying that, that he works with um, Maryland Department of Agriculture Nox Noxious Weeds Program, and so they, I think, had some questions about that. Um, I guess maybe we can do some follow-up uh, checking in with Lane to see if there were particular questions that we might be able to help round up answers to. Yeah, I can, I can up in here if you want. Um, <laughs> how you doing? Yeah, um, it's kind of off the topic, so I didn't. I was going to wait to the end. I can wait to the end and just had a couple of questions about noxious oh, weeds. And, yeah. Okay. Um, obviously, the, my biggest question is is um, awareness of the noxious weed law, and and um, we've run into at least one case this last summer where we had a complaint by one farmer on an organic farmer's fields, and it was a real mess. It was a cornfield that was pretty much solid. Palmer amaranth. Um, that's the gentleman who's planning on using one of these zappers this next year in his rotation with soybeans. So, <clears throat> so again, I was just interested in, in number one, the awareness that uh, Palmer amaranth and water hemp are on the law now. 
and definitely those are weeds that are going to be a problem for you all being organic. Um, and that was why, I mean, I, I spoke to the MAFA group last year, um, to update them on what was going on. I just was looking, looking for outreach. The other side of the question is, is that our group, uh, we have cooperative county programs that actually do spraying. And generally in the counties, they're local, and they know where the organic growers are and who doesn't want them to spray near them. And we try to honor that if we can. Um, so again, trying to get the two-way street where we're, you're aware of us and we're aware of you, if you will. That was, that was kind of the drift. My, my county doesn't know where I am. I don't think it's, I have <laughs> an issue, issues around road signs and I, I need to get some signs for next year. I guess they would probably abide by that, but um, there's, you know, oodles of road signs near my field. So, um, and I, I, I've had Palmer, you know, in the fields and the weed zapper is definitely um, took care of that this year. So I feel like I'm getting a handle on that. Um, I mean, you know, so if somebody sees one out there, you know, I guess they're by law can go spray it, the, the county or, or MDA. Um, no, I we mean, can't actually. Just to uh, clarify oh, that, okay. we, we have no rights to go onto your property and treat. Okay. Okay. That, so, and we would not do that. Um, if we, what our, our role is, is we generally are having, doing scouting or we get reports. Gen generally, we're scouting and finding it. And then we would notify the landowner if, you know, if we didn't know who was actually cropping it um, of the problem and it would be up to them to take care of it. Now on, a, on conventional farms, you know, they can go out and spray. I know that in some cases, but, um, or they can, our group does do some spraying, but generally we don't do field crop spraying, um, but we don't have the right to do it. And we wouldn't, you know, that would, that would get everybody in trouble. Huh? All right. Um. Another um, question that we missed before, I don't think you touched on this, you may have, um, do either of you, or does anyone on Delmarva sell organic grain to Purdue? Uh, yes, yeah, they probably most, a lot of people do. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're a big buyer, especially in, with the mill in Herlock that they take mm -hmm. corn and wheat there. And then, but a lot of it Purdue buys up in Pennsylvania too, or North Carolina, but I think most from here would, would go to Pennsylvania, I, I think, so Herlock, it has to be dry corn, 15.5% moisture or less. Um, Purdue will take, you know, higher moisture corn and, and charge you a monstrous fee to dry it up in Pennsylvania. So that's, uh, there's, you yeah, know, the, the option. Um, but if you don't have your own dryer, that's, you know, one option. Uh, there's other buyers that will take wet corn too, but. Hey, Aaron, what's, what's the threshold for uh, Don for the vomitoxin? Um, for corn, it is 20 parts per billion because I all my, my whole bin this year has it. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what it is. I'm waiting. I'm going to try to sell it somewhere else, obviously. But um, I had had really low yielding corn this year. I, I don't know what it, we had a, a drought, I guess a little drought in early July on our sandy ground. And I think we had a lot of damaged kernels, really high damage. And um, I, I don't know. I'm like the only one I know about that has it. It's really boggles my mind why my corn <laughs> is like that this year but um, uh, what about the small grain is it around five parts oh, per all, all sm small grain for human it's uh yeah one one oh, parts wow. that's per yeah for human for for food feed grade I'm, i've had a contract for wheat feed grade wheat before where they would take up to 10 parts per billion or million whatever it is you know the um but that was pretty high i want to say purdue at herlock might be five maybe five or seven or something, but, but for food grade, it's gotta be below one. So. Um, right. Uh, and also besides just um, you know, disease, but they also test for uh, any other foreign contaminants. So uh, conventional uh, varieties or any, like, uh, if it's corn, uh, any BT corn in there, they have a way to test for that or for, for uh, any sort of pesticides too. And there are um, thresholds for that. I've heard of uh, um, uh, guys trying to deliver to Purdue, I think, with a, a dry product, but uh, after sampling, um, they had to turn the whole truckload away. And I've, find some I've, to do with it. I've had that before, and I, I, a lot of people had it that year. Or they uh, had more rejections, and I, uh, some people were thinking they were sampling conventional trucks with the same probe and not uh -huh. cleaning the probe. They said they cleaned the probe, but I, any little bit of dust in there could transfer, and um, I, I had to get the load back. I took it again and it was fine. So it's one of those 
deal. Sometimes you just pull your hair out <laughs> with a yeah. GMO mm-hmm. sampling. And since we're on the topic, usually for any of our truckloads going up to Pennsylvania, we have a clean truck affidavit that we fill out every time we ensure that the, the truck is, is clean. Um, usually it's the same trucker every time. It's multiple load after load. So as so long as it's clean the first time and every successive load is your product, you shouldn't have any problem. But anybody, if you're hiring or if the, the buyer is setting up the, the trucking, make sure and be very sure it is clean. And I'm sure you will have some sort of clean truck affidavit with all the information, your information, the bin it comes from, the, uh, the trucker's information, your license, um, you know, signatures, things like that. Um, and also you'll, you'll hold on to all those papers for any of your record keeping, obviously. But yeah, clean truck, simple thing, but it can be overlooked. So yeah, no residues in there. And um, a, lot of, a lot of trucks come from Baltimore. They hauled some um, uh, food grade uh, type items in. We've I've cl- crawled underneath into these super hoppers, climbed up in there and scraped out little bits and corners with a, a screwdriver and or I've turned, I've turned trucks away to go get a wash down the road from us as a way station. They do a clean out too. So they'll spray it out. Um, but um, it's something you've got to be conscious of and aware of. Yeah, it helps. Like if I haul to, to Herlock with my own tractor trailer, they're it's a lot more forgiving coming off the farm. They don't, you don't, you, you need to blow out with air, sign a paper that you did that, but you know before you started hauling organic, if you were had conventional in it before. Um, but with commercial truckers, you know that are haul, coming and picking up that haul other things, you know they're really they really want the washout. Or like Purdue does a lot of times. I, I don't know that all buyers do, but. Um, I think Purdue will require that, but it is much easier hauling off with your own truck off your own farm. It's a little more lenient. Right. All right. I think um, Neve and I have a couple final questions. We're running, um, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, Thank you all for your questions. And um, I'll let um, Neve go ahead. She had a couple of things to say. Oh, you mean just like some of those wrap up things? Uh, yeah. And then did you want to mention the, um, the Mac soil health event? Um, yeah, that would be great. So, um, uh, I know, you know, there was a question about, um, nutrient management and some of these things that you were also bringing up, Stephen, and these are questions and issues that the million acre challenge also known as the Mac, um, is looking at for soil health more broadly. And, and I think your farm is part of the soil health benchmarking study. Is that right? Um, and it Aaron's too, both, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so for, for anybody who um, uh, on this call is not familiar with the Million Acre Challenge, there was also a PDF uh, that gave information about them and they have two upcoming events for the soil health curious. And I will put them in the chat box here. And uh, I guess, Elizabeth, since you're here, if you want to just briefly mention um, anything about these, feel free to do so. Oh, she, I think her, her internet has been going in and out. Maybe, um, Lisa, if you wanted to share anything about them. Oh, you are here. Oh, great. Yeah. I'm here for now. I've been, I've been disappearing off and on all, all, to, all day. Um, Yeah, uh, we're excited to offer a couple of soil health focused events. The first one is December the 8th. um, And this one is what we're considering a statewide meeting from 8 to 9.30 in the morning. Um, We have a farmer panel. And then um, after the panel, we're going to be breaking out into um, smaller groups by production systems. So that hopefully will give farmers a chance to have kind of this style of conversation, sort of less structured, more, um, more time. So we're looking forward to that. And then the next day is a 30 minute lunch and learn um, with Steve Poffenberger, who manages um, Willard Farms. And um, so either one, uh, come join us. We'd love to see you. Thanks. Yeah. And so there's that flyer uh, in the email as well that has more information about the Million Acre Challenge. And then the other piece I just wanted to mention was if you know of anybody who's interested in getting mentorship in the transition process um, to let us know. We're, as I said, we're very lucky that Stephen and Aaron are both um, mentors for this um, program. So um, feel free to reach out to any of us if you have questions about that. Thanks, Sarah. 
Yeah, and I guess just um, each of you to close, if you just briefly want to talk about your overall impression of how um, your organic farming has gone. Um, is it worth it is kind of the overall theme question. Um, somebody had asked a question about what aspect was most unexpected for you. Um, so like when you got into it, was this something that really took you by surprise and overall, um, do you think it's, are, are you pleased with it? And do you think the benefits outweigh the cost? So if you wanna just um, close with any, any of those questions. Um, I, I guess, yeah, the, I, I'm thinking in preconceived notions I had when I started think, thinking I could, all I had to do was disc twice and cultivate twice and I would be good. And that, that I've learned I need many more tools in the toolbox, like the flame or the weed zapper or the, you know, I, I don't have a time, you know, other, other tools, um, better rotation, longer rotation. I don't know. There's just a lot of things that, um, you know, I've learned over the years and I'm still learning every year. Um, you know, every year is different and I don't know, some, something changes and, I'm trying new things and I enjoy that, but um, I kind of go overboard sometimes on new things and that, uh, like Steve was saying, you need to try those on enough acres that it makes a difference, but it's small enough that you don't burn yourself on it. Um, but overall, I, I back to the, I guess, the quality of life, not not trying to, if I, you know, I'm going to farm and do grain farming, I'm, it's, it's either, you know, do a, thousand two thousand acres of conventional grain or um you know concentrate on a smaller amount of acres and do organic and um you know feel like you're ho hopefully in the long run benefiting the soil and the environment and um you know in fact i guess the word sustainable means a lot of things but but it's got to be economically sustainable and you know i can do that on a small acreage and not pull my hair out too much <laughs> and and hopefully make a living at it so uh yeah i agree with aaron on uh, many of those points but i'd say uh to answer that question about the transition process and what was um, unexpected i was i don't know if it was necessarily a transition process if if you are starting in a, a small enough scale where you are paying attention to it and you can get to that um, organic um certification point uh the <laughs> probably after that it maybe became a, a little trickier once you're organic uh, and, and you have the weeds maybe being introduced into your system um is trying to catch up and that might be the most the tr trickiest thing with the transition is getting in a, a negative cycle of uh, of, uh, of basically the weeds and then maybe weather and timing um and trying to yeah uh, just get things in early enough where you can get your spring is as important as your fall. A street crop would, would say to, to summarize, treat your cover crop like your cash crop. And your, your, your season, you really have two seasons. You got your, your planting season, then you got your two planting seasons, spring and fall. Uh, you really want to start you know, looking at uh, your, your cover crops uh, a little differently and, and trying to, uh, well, definitely you got to work with the programs that we already have. There's programs that pay to do it. It's, it's you least break even. Sometimes you do a little bit better. We're, Participating on um, with a program with Equip, uh, not with Max, since we've been double dipping, but we're getting a payment um, of eighty-five dollars an acre with three practices combined, and that that was with the help of a local uh, NRCS field office and, and talking with them and helping us helping them put it together for us and you know trying something a, a little bit more new, but you know helping us with that process and uh, making it manageable for us. Um, you know, they were able to work with us and, you know, a little bit of a give and take, a little bit of flexibility in the programs. The programs are there. They're, they're ready. We're participating in the Million Acre Challenge, for example, but also with the MBA grant program this year, uh, where we added extra $10 per acre for adding species or delaying our cover crop termination after May 1st, and which is what we wanted to do anyway, but this made that decision just a little bit easier. And, um, we're definitely grateful for that. So, um, but definitely probably the bottom line, big picture is start looking at the cover crops. Trey Hill does planting green. He's still a conventional farmer, but he's he's done a lot of work with his planting green techniques and his equipment and his varieties and the timing and, and all of that. And he's out there talking, he's out giving these lectures. Um, and um, there's a lot of other um, expertise out there now, ever even since I started. Um, 
Max and NRCS, like I mentioned, USDA, ARS. Uh, I see uh, Michelle, uh, he's uh, watching, and um, him and Steve Mursky and all these all their all their support have been instrumental on the on farm research um, at, at their location on this farm, and I know they will be in the future. And we try to support them. These programs don't exist unless we participate, um, and there's interest in them. And I, I think um, just starting to have that conversation is is probably the, the first step. Is, is to talk with, with uh, these producers or these experts. The Rodale Institute has got a lot of good information, and even the University of Maryland, um, they have a lot. They, they're put more, putting more emphasis on cover crops and soil health and things like that. So, um, those are always those are all good footings to start with. And then these all the tools in the toolbox that Aaron mentioned, all this assistance, which is free by the way, um, expertise with the partners and community. It just come so far, and you're just growing right now. Come a long way, and um, I just think that, yeah, the, the, the help is there. You just got to go look for it. It's a very hopeful note to, uh, to end on. And I just wanted to say, you know, there are so many um, facets of farming to dive into. And we were, you know, basically there was a little bit of a shot in the dark of what would a, a farmer wanting to transition ask um, since we didn't get the chance to have any specific farmer um, here, thank you for taking the time to really, really think through what are the, the, the details and what are the questions that we should be thinking about. Um, so just, yeah, appreciate your time and, and sharing your, your insights and knowledge. Well, you're welcome, we're glad to do it. Thank you both so much. And thank you, Shannon, as well, for all your contributions. And um, thank you all for participating. We'll have the recording um, and I'll send everyone a follow-up email with those documents that Shannon mentioned. Um, and if you'd like the recording, just let me know and I can send that to you as well. So.